Okay, well, welcome all. Uh, thank you for attending this How to Record session. So today we're quite lucky. We've got three Vice County Recorders covering mammals. So we've got Sam Dyer, Jean Matthews and Martin Bailey. So they're three out of five of our Vice County Recorders for mammals. So we're very fortunate. So there's a lot of experience there today that we can learn from. So I should introduce myself. I'm Richard Gallen. So I'm a recording specialist. So I'm very good at recording YouTube clips, hopefully. Uh, we've also got Ashley Carrick. Uh, Ashley May, sorry, uh, and she, she'll be covering some of the Covnod information that we would like to share with you about what records we have and how to submit records to us. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what makes a good biological record. I think a lot of people have already seen this before, but worth refreshing over it just to get everyone up to speed. Right, so course outline. Well, I'll start off with a very basic how to record. Uh, Ashley will then take over and introduce some of our systems and talk about what data we have on our, our Covenant database there. Uh, if you've got any questions about that, you might want to have them in the chat by then and we, we can answer them then. And then we'll hand over to the mammal specialists and they'll be taking you through some more in-depth Sort of recording techniques for mammals and then we'll have a round up with questions at the end there. Okay so people like to think of records, uh, what is a record? Well we like to think of it as four W's so I've said this so many times now I'm sure you're sick of me saying this but I'll do it anyway so what is it, what have you seen, either a badger or the scientific name so you can enter these things into a a record using the common name, Welsh name, uh, scientific name, even a family name. There's lots of different ways to do that. Obviously you need to know where you've seen your species record, so put the local town, maybe a, an area. Uh, don't use things like my garden, it's a bit so difficult to somebody in your record in the future to appreciate where that is, say in 50 years time, it, it becomes meaningless. But if you put, put Bangor or Clandidno, much more obvious where it is. And then obviously a grid reference is extremely helpful. Uh, nice to give a good accurate grid reference, maybe six figure, which is essentially a hundred meters by hundred meters, or maybe even finer, sort of going up to uh, eight figures, which is a 10 by 10 meter grid. But just use whatever you can and you can grab the, this information off a phone or you can just plot it on a map. We've got special maps on the Covenod website where you can see exactly where you were. And then you also need to know when, so essentially the date of the record. So that's not the date you input the record into a system, that's the date you actually saw the animal. So put it in as a, an exact day, a like month, season, possibly even a year. Okay, yes, I'm uh, then a who. Uh, so the name of the person that saw it, so obviously a full name is best. You can put part name. If you don't know who made the record, put Anon. Uh, say if somebody had sort of related the record to you, a mate, a friend of a friend had seen this, put it down as Anon if you don't know the name. Don't use things like me because it, that's, once again, is a meaningless thing to a record in the future. Uh, so why do we re record? Well, there's lots of different reasons people do biological recording. So you might just be personally interested in that species group. So it's a perfectly valid reason for recording, really. Uh, but the nice thing is that recording covers lots of bases. So although you might be recording for personal interest, it also has conservation benefits because you're putting that information into the hands of people that need to know where th rare species are, where common species are, and how not to damage the sort of conservation value of some of these species. And this feeds into atlases, so your records can join with lots of other people's records to form useful overviews of the entire area. And then data is also useful for planning decisions as well. So 
unless we know where badger sets are, pine martins, water voles, who can take them into account if we don't have the records. So please bear that in mind. If you see something interesting, let us know. And then the right people get to know about these species and can then consider them in their decisions. So what do we want to record? Well, mammals are interesting because you can record live ones, dead ones, signs of them. So you might find a skull lying around, droppings. So I know the mammal recorders will go into this in more detail. So I won't labour the point. So even common things we want to know, grey squirrels, red squirrels. Uh, red squirrels were very common in the, in the past, not so now. Uh, could that happen to other species in the future that are common now? So we've always got that eye on the future. So something's really common now, get those records in, because they could be valuable in, in, to assess conservation in the future. Rarities are always interesting, odd records. We, we did have a record of a, a, a red net wallaby carcass washed up on the coast. And apparently it probably floated across from an island in, near Ireland where there's a little colony of them. So interesting, strange records that you'd never expect. So always good to, to do there. And once again, I hinted at those long-term trends. Without continuous recording, we can't really get a handle on how species are doing, really. So this is where you come in, putting your records on the Cognob system. Uh, I did say record everything. Well, we don't want hourly records of a squirrel coming to your feeder through the day or, or things like that. It could be a bit over the top, really. But I think it should be all right if you just put one, one in for the week or every now and again that you see it just to confirm it's still coming to your feed. So where do you want to go once you've got your records? You want to get to Paddle in Wales. Uh, who else has recorded it in an area? Well, a daring system is very useful. It covers the whole of Wales and you can then plot different species. It's all free. You can go on there and you'll then see whether you're record that you've just made is interesting, whether it's regionally significant or what have you. So there's just an example of famous great orm goats have suddenly decided to spread it across Clan Didno. Probably the first records away from the great orm for a long time, but there you go. So we wouldn't know that unless we'd looked at the databases to see what, how they'd been recorded in the past. And there's just a screen grab of a Derin. So there was the website on the previous slide. You can either plot individual species using distribution maps or have a just, just a general species list from what's in your area if you want to know what to look out for. So that's quite a nice feature. Probably a more pertinent thing for us today is the North Wales Mammal Group Atlas. And that essentially feeds off data that's in Covnod. So you can plot different species at different resolutions. Uh, so the most sensitive species are restricted to broader resolutions. So obviously you don't want to be showing exact locations of badger sets to everybody, as you can appreciate. So please log on onto that website and have a play and see what you can find. And also MBN Atlas, that's always a useful resource if you want to see things at a whole Britain scale so you can then appreciate sort of the detail across the whole of the island of Britain really. So that's worth having a look at and all these resources are free so you do sometimes have to sign up for them to get better data access rights but generally you can just use them straight off so that's quite nice. Right so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour from me. What I'll do, I'll hand you over to Ashley and she'll be able to ca carry on with explaining more about what data we hold in Covenod. So are you there, Ashley? Right, Barada uh, Baub. Um, uh, I'll very quickly move through a little bit of information about record submission because I know Sam, Jean and Martin will have lots to say later on. Um, so 
I thought it'd be interesting just to have a quick look at what we have in the Covenant database in terms of mammal records. Um, overall, we have nearly four and a half million records of all different species groups. And in terms of mammal records, they make up about 2% of the total. Um, so about 100,000 records, um, which is a considerable number of records. Um, but as Richard's already mentioned, if you want to see where the distribution of certain species are and where the gaps are, looking at a Derin or the North Wales Mammal Atlas is very useful. And what you'll find is that um, it's, the distribution of certain species records is quite patchy. So for example, with red squirrel records, although we have a large number of them, um, and in this table of top 10 mammal species, they're number three there on seven and a half thousand almost. But by far the majority of those come from Klakainok, where there's a monitoring project underway and where the uh, people working there put all the records onto our system. So there, there will be hot spots um, where there is, there's a lot of recording, um, but there are always gaps. So it's always worth putting your records in. Um, the top 10 mammal species list here shows there's a lot of um, records of certain bat species. Again, that's because of monitoring projects. Um, we have um, targeted projects like Record a Hedgehog that's been on our system for a number of years. So that's encouraged people to put their hedgehog records in. But of course, there's also a large number of those come from um, Tracy, in fact. So thank you very much, Tracy. You've contributed a lot of those hedgehog records to us. Um, moving on to how records end up in the Covenant database. Uh, there are two ways. There's the online recording system, which I know many of you already use, um, or we can import data from spreadsheets. So if you have data in a spreadsheet format, certainly not worth putting it all in individually onto the online recording system or ORS, uh, you can always email us the spreadsheet. So when we look at the database as a whole, most of the data we hold has been imported from spreadsheets. However, with mammal data, that drops to about 65%, which means that over a third of the mammal records we hold have been put on through the online recording system. So that's interesting. Um, so we have individual recorders using just the standard data entry form, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, and between them, they've contributed nearly 6,000 mammal records. But then there's also quite a lot that go on through these targeted projects. So for example, the recorder hedgehog form. Then there are local recording groups, which use customized areas of the ORS, and they enter multiple records from ongoing monitoring. Um, and this might include camera trap records. So we have uh, projects like the Northeast Wales Dormouse Monitoring Project. They've been putting records on for 10, 12 years onto the system. The Klakaina Red Squirrel Trust, which is quite a recent um, newcomer to using the ORS, but have, are always putting records on. Uh, we, we have projects that maybe run for a shorter time, like there was a project called Nature Spy in Northeast Wales and they were using camera traps and putting all the records onto the ORS. Uh, we have local volunteers monitoring seal populations in certain areas and using the ORS or, or sending spreadsheet data. And then we've got organizations like the Wildlife Trust, Wild Ground and NRW. Um, some of their staff will enter records from all species group on the, onto the ORS and quite a large proportion of those will be mammal records. Right. Um, we also, um, in terms of staff and volunteers, we've captured some quite a number of records of mammals from paper documents, including a project we ran some years ago looking at CCW files, but also more recently consultancy reports. Um, and they would include quite a number of mammal records, bats especially. Um, in terms of spreadsheet format, we have local and national recording groups that specialise in mammals who will share data with us, uh, such as the Snowdonian Mammal Group, who collected a huge number of records as part of an atlas project um, in the, well, between about 2005 and 2009. We've got the Cluid Bat Group, the Gwyneth Bat Group, Cluid Badger Group, Bat Conservation Trust, who run the um, National Bat Monitoring Programme on a UK basis, the Mammal Society, 
And then there's temporary projects. Another one would be um, the Mammals in Sustainable Environment project that was running some years ago. So there's, there's often a lot of emphasis on recording mammals. Um, and thankfully, uh, much of this data does find its way to us. Um, now, many of the records that are entered by non-specialists will require verification or checking by the county recorders. So they have a really, really important role to play. And this table shows you that actually there's quite a number of um, experts verifying mammal records in North Wales. So as well as um, Jean, Alison and Sam that cover um, particular vice counties and cover all mammals, we've also got Betty Lee, who's joined us today as well, who uh, verifies all the Clued Badger Group, all the records in, in North East Wales for badgers. Um, Sam and Tim Hodna also verify bat records in North East Wales and Malcolm Ingham and Martin then cover the other mammals in those counties. Um, it's worth saying that verifiers work generally on vice county basis. These, these are old counties, um, so we have five in North Wales, Flintshire, Denbyshire, Anglesey, Carnarvonshire and Mary Amethyshire. Um, we also have somebody who's dedicated to looking at marine mammals, and that's Nia Jones. And she, so if you put in a record of a marine mammal, it'll be Nia that will verify it. So a huge thanks is due to all these experts that look at these records uh, for us, uh, because um, certainly for, for some of the species, um, it can be quite difficult to be sure what, what you're seeing. Um, if you want to find out who the local expert is in a particular area, on our website, if you go to www.org.uk um, recording and click on find a local expert, you can check for a particular species group, um, what area and who the, who the relevant person is. Um, so how to submit mammal records to Covnod? Well, the ORS is a good starting point, as I've said, um, or we can um, accept uh, spreadsheets. Um, there are a couple of other options. You may have heard of the Lurk Wales app, which you can also use. That data does come to us, but it's not quite as immediate as putting your records into the ORS, but it does have some advantages. Um, and iRecord, which is a all um, UK system as well, it um, works similarly to the Lurk Wales app. Actually, the, those records all go into the same place and we download them and import them from time to time. Um, but the main thing is that you shouldn't have to submit records to two places, so contact me or Richard to check if you're unsure. So I was just going to give you a very quick introduction to the ORS. Uh, many of you use it already, so I will skim through it as quickly as possible, but it is useful to have an idea if you haven't used it before. Um, it's about 14 years old and we have a new version which is due to be launched in the next couple of months and you'll be able to use that from a smartphone in the field, although it's not an app, but it will work quite well in a smartphone when you're out and about. So that should help a little bit and it, it will be a little bit more sophisticated and user friendly. So keep an eye out for announcements about that. Um, the ORS was designed and developed by um, us in-house. Um, and it's really evolved over the years so that as well as having um, a standard form that you can use on it and some public projects, as I mentioned earlier, there's quite a few groups that use it um, and they have access to a special form and they can share their records between each other on that um, area. So it's really quite a unique system. Um, you can register from the Covenant website or log in if you're already registered. Uh, the, a whole system works um, in Welsh and in English. You just have to swap over. Um, that's the Welsh version of the website there. Um, registering only takes a few minutes. You need an email address, um, uh, but that's about it. And then you get uh, to the Covenant members area, which you'll see pop up as an extra tab on the top right of your uh, website, um, of the website at that point. Um, Within there, there'll be a bit of information at the top that's specific to you about what records you've put in before. Um, and then at, down at the bottom left, you've got my details where you can change your password if you want. But it is quite useful because there's a place there you can put in your recording interests and some notes about your recording 
background and skills and experience, and that can be quite useful for a county recorder who's looking at a record that they can know, um, you know, a bit about your experience with that particular species group. Um, we also have, um, yeah, under enter records, if you click on that, you'll then get to the standard data entry and also some, spe some um, specific projects that everyone has access to. Um, and the main mammal one would be record a hedgehog, but there are projects looking at different um, species groups as well. And all they do is they just have some extra fields that you might want to fill in because people have identified that that's relevant to that particular species. So it's um, quite useful if you are recording, for example, um, a hedgehog that you use the record a hedgehog record, but it's not um, form, but it's not essential. You can use the standard form for any species. So this is the standard data entry form. Um, and the first uh, thing you would do is choose your species group. So there's a drop down list and you would choose mammals, um, click on that, and then you can type in a bit of the name of the species you're looking for. And you, as Richard said, you can use English names, Welsh names or scientific names. Um, if you're not sure what the actual species is, but you know what the genus is, for example, you can put a record in like that. And it's always worth doing that if you're not sure, um, rather than guessing what the actual species is. Um, yeah, the uh, species dictionary uh, comes from the UK species inventory managed by the Natural History Museum. So it's a very standard list. Um, and the Welsh names come from Cymdeithas Edward Clwyd. So again, very standard list of names. Um, you would then um, put your site name in. So we put in some location details and you can enter a grid reference. Um, if you don't know the grid reference, you can just click find on map and find it from there. If you do know the grid reference, it's worth clicking on find a map anyway, just to check it. Um, you can search by place name or postcode to start with if you are using the map facility and you want to, and then you can narrow down to where you're talking about. So the online mapping functionality is quite good. Um, this is a view of the Ordnance Survey type map for Pentrith Forest, um, uh, but you can also change up at the top left to aerial photograph. And if you're zoomed in a bit further, you can really, um, you know, uh, hone into a very specific area. Um, and it's worth saying actually that um, I would think that eight figure grid references or 10 meter resolution is probably best for mammal records, certainly for badger sets. Um, I know it's very helpful to Betty if she's trying to relocate a badger set where someone's put in a record if it's quite a specific grid reference. Um, sometimes maybe for bat records, it, it, you might want a six figure if you just knew they were foraging in that particular area rather than being very specific. Um, you then would enter a cat, some count information if relevant. Um, you, you can actually just type some text into that box if you want, if it's very vague, something like lots of, of something or, or, you know, particularly for other species groups. But if you can put a count, then that's fine. Um, and you may be able to put a record type or a abundance qualifier in some cases, you might know that it was a female, for example, or a juvenile or something like that. Um, you might be able to say that it was badger set, or etc. There's, there's a lot of options under those drop down lists. And then this is really important um, that you've got the attachment area there where you can attach evidence. And in some cases, this isn't easy, but in many cases, you may have a photograph or even for bat records, it might be a sound file that's being recorded. So um, you can attach any of those files. At the moment, you can only attach one file, although you can zip several up together and attach that zipped folder. But in the future ORS, you'll be able to attach multiple photographs. Um, and when the county recorders look at this evidence, sometimes they might even realize that the species name needs updating, um, but it, it, it can certainly make it possible to verify a record where it wouldn't be possible otherwise. So it's really important if you have that to put that um, information there. 
Um, oh, uh, just to show you that it's not always super glamorous recording mammals. Thank you, David. Um, this is a photograph. David's attached to a recent record of water vole um, showing the droppings so the verifier can look at these and decide is it um, correct or not. And then um, a really um, impressive photo here of a stoat carrying a kit that Vic Payne put in recently. Um, I think that's probably really unusual to catch that on camera, so really nice. So we do get some really nice um, photos attached to records submitted, as well as the roadkill ones, etc. Um, we then move over to the right hand side of the form and the recorder name box will default to the name of the person entering the record, but you can change that if you're putting in somebody else's record. You can add multiple recorders by clicking on the little plus box to the right of it. Um, you can add notes, and this is important again, to describe any features that were distinguishing if the species was unusual, and to add anything else that you think is relevant to the county recorder or anyone looking at the record. So for, for badger sets, I know Betty has told me that putting in the number of well-used holes and signs of any badger digging, snaring, etc., should also be mentioned. So anything relevant there, put under notes. And confidence level, you do need to put a confidence level um, when you're entering your own records. And um, if, if you're putting in a record of something and you're really not sure, it's important to put a low confidence level because that will ensure that it is checked by the county recorder. So you then click Submit Record at the bottom left of the page. You'll see your record pop up below in the table. And if you need to, you can edit it with the pencil symbol or delete it. Um, or in fact, you can copy it if you want to um, quickly make a new record and then just change one aspect of the of this record. Um, the padlock symbols next to each field, if you are entering a whole long list of hedgehog records, for example, and you choose hedgehog at the top there and then lock it down, uh, then as you submit each record, that information will be retained. So if you're putting in a lot of records from one site, maybe, and you lock down all the site information and the date and the recorder, and then just change your species name, that can really save time entering records. So once you've entered your records under the view records option, you'd always be able to go and look at those records. Um, there'll be probably a few options there if you've submitted records under different projects. Um, and you tick next to the ones you want to see and then click view records. This is just an example of some Swift records, um, just showing you that once you've entered the record, if you spot that there's something that you need to change, but you can no longer edit it yourself, you can click on that little speech bubble and add a comment and we'll see that comment. So it could be something like, oh, I've realized that that grid reference is wrong. Can you change it? So we, we can do that for you. Um, there's also a quick filter option there, which means that if you've got lots of records of different species, but you want to maybe quickly just see the records of that particular species, you click on that and you can choose that. Um, or perhaps all the records you made on that sighting date, for example. Um, there are also tools on that page to um, map your records or download them um, and also to list all the unique species. So if you want a kind of summary of what records you put in, that can be quite interesting. Um, and if you want to map or download just a selection, if you filter first, like maybe you want to see all the records you've put in of um, hedgehogs again, you filter for those first and then um, click on the tools button and map them. And then you can see those records distributed on the map. The status of your record on the right of the screen will change as somebody verifies it. Um, so those are the verification levels. So country recorders um, look at a high proportion of the records and they will usually set them to probably or known correct. Sometimes if they can't be sure, they would set it to unconfirmed. And often if it's known incorrect or probably incorrect, it'll be because there's a photograph or something and it's obvious what it should be. And then we can update that and let you know, which is quite useful. Um, it's worth saying that, yeah, the records are prioritized for checking 
by things like there's an ID difficulty rating that was set by the Mammal Society across the UK. So some species don't generally get looked at because they're thought to be very easy to ID, whereas a lot of them aren't. Um, there are some other automated checks too. And then if you put a low confidence level, the record will be looked at as well. And that's a quick whistle stop tour, really, of, of the ORS. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Uh, we've had what, a couple of questions in, so I think I'll, I'll pose these. I think the first one's probably relevant to you there, Ashley. So David's asked if he's submitting data via a spreadsheet, and presumably he also has some photographic evidence. Is there any way he, that can be added to that record? And I, I guess that has some relevance to the new ORS, doesn't it? So, yeah, well, uh, the way of doing it really is to send us the record zipped up um, with, but ideally with some kind of ID on them that links to the records themselves. Um, uh, but yeah, if you talk to us about it and, and get the photographs to us, we can attach them to those records. We have done that for a couple of data sets. And it is really important that that information is there. So, um, yeah. Definitely just give us a shout and we can sort that out. Even, even old records, if you suddenly find you've got a photo, it's always useful to mm. dig, dig those photos out and attach them to records you've submitted to us. Because obviously the vice count you uh, record uh, can then look at that photo and suddenly their confidence in that record can increase dramatically just from that evidence. And, also, the new, the new ORS will allow you to add multiple photos. So at the moment, you can only really attach one photo unless you zip them up into a folder, like Ashling said. So just bear that in mind. And the more photos you can take from different angles, the better for some records, things like polecats in particular. But I'll let the mammal experts explain more about that. OK, Anne Griffiths has posed a question. Uh, da, da, da. So, will records entered through BTO's Garden Bird Watch scheme, that includes insects and mammals, butterflies, etc., make it to Covnod? Yes, they will. Um, I think the mammal records that go on to that scheme actually get shared and verified by the Mammal Society, and they will um, be shared with us, but it won't be necessarily immediately. There's sometimes a bit of a time delay in, in getting data from the larger schemes and but but yes you shouldn't have to submit them twice okay and Dawn's asked is there a uh, template spreadsheet you prefer us to use um, yes a nice easy it's question on, uh, it's on it's on I think it's on the submit records page on the website but if you can't find it just give us a shout and we can send it to you okay thank you I think that's all the questions for our section. Uh, I guess we'll hand over now to either Jean, Sam or Martin. I don't know which of you would like to start first. Have you had the decision? Unmute um, yourself. I offered to start first. So. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you, Jean. So, uh, Jean Matthews, I'll let you introduce yourself because you, you've had lots of different hats on in the past. So <laughs> you can tell us which one you're wearing today. Okay, thank you. Um, so I shall um, start with the presentation. So um, we've heard some a little bit about why record bats, but I'll say a little bit more. A very qu quick whiz through bat ecology, bat species in Wales, some of the legal and health and safety considerations in recording bats, and a little bit about identifying recording bats and some further sources of further information. So first of all, um, mammals, as, as um, Ashling has said, are generally under-recorded compared to some of the other species groups um, and bat populations have suffered historical declines. And in the recent State of Mammals in Wales review, many of the bat species were, were considered to be data deficient. So we just don't really have the, the baseline information about them to know how the populations are doing now. Bats are also indicators of the health of the environment. So if you've got good bat populations, it suggests that a lot of things are working well, which is another reason for recording them and monitoring them. 
and un unlike things that come out in the day they're, they're quite fascinating to learn about they don't make it easy for you but um there is no there is a lot to learn and um, it can be a challenge but there's there's something that anybody can do whether they've got any equipment or, or not so this is very very basic bit of um uh, ecology and I'm sure everybody is, is familiar with the, the myths and uh, aware of which things are myths and which things are not myths but just to, to whiz through it they are mammals and they give birth to um, what a young a pup they're called um, usually one younger year occasionally twins but um, they don't have litters and they don't have more than one uh, season and the pups are fed on milk until they're able to, to fly and hunt for themselves and they only eat insects. You, we, you think this, we think this may be obvious, but the number of injured bats you get that have been helpfully given a bit of lettuce or tomato or something in the box with them, um, it, it's obviously not obvious to everybody. So they eat insects which they eat in flight or sometimes they glean them from leaves or the, the ground. They do have good eyesight, but they use their echolocation to hunt and to navigate and they roost mainly in tree holes and cavities. They don't build nests and they don't excavate cavities. Again, you might think this is obvious, but the number of builders that have told me they've found a bat's nest in a building is, is you know, it's been quite a few over the years. In some of the females from a wide area congregate in nursery or maternity roosts, and they need warmth for the development of the young. So this is the, the time starting now really when when the females are starting to gather and their presence becomes more obvious this year's cold so it's not really helping them um, males generally prefer cooler roost sites because they don't need the warmth so they they save energy by roosting in cooler sites and both sexes will slow the body down and reduce the temperature using torpor to save uh, energy um, and they'll extend the torpor in, into periods of hibernation when the weather's unsuitable for insects to fly. So there's no food, there's no point in, in waking up and, and going out and looking for it. Although over winter they will wake up to, to go and have a drink even if there's no food sometimes. So broadly speaking, the bat year in, over the winter they're hibernating. But if the weather's above about, if the temperature's above about six degrees and um, it's relatively mild, not dry, low winds, then they may come out if, if there are insects out to, to feed on. And then they're in transitional roots, roosts between maternity roosts and wind hibernation sites in the spring. Um, very variable depending on the weather. And then they gather in the maternity roosts and the babies are born sort of late May, June and independent by July, August. And then at that time, the maternity roosts start to, um, they, they split up and, and the bats sort of go off to, to other roost sites where they don't need to be in the, in the warmth. Um, and mating takes place then or, or over winter. So I've just grouped the species really into um, ones that are, uh, more, you're more likely to find or you're more likely to be able to record and more likely to be able to identify um, rather than dealing with individual species. So the, the first group is the, the pipistrels and generally if you're out and about of an early evening and you see a bat flying around, if you say that's a pipistrel, you're probably going to be right. Um, you can't always, you, you know, there are other species that are out relatively early in the evening but not it is most likely to be a common or a soprano pipistrelle because they are the most common and widespread species and they roost in buildings, sometimes trees, so they're, they're around where we are quite a lot of the time. The Nathusius pipistrelle, we have a few odd records of and we don't really know its status in, in Wales. It's um, it's common in, in Ireland and it's more common in some parts of England um, and it's possibly it migrates across North Wales between the two. It's, it's a long distance migrant on the on the continent and to South East England, but we, we still don't know that much about it here. There are two brown, sorry, two long-eared bat species. The, the bat on the, um, the left is, is one of the pipistrelle species and the, the bat on the, the bottom right screen is a long-eared bat and you can tell why it's got that name. Um, there are two long-eared species. The grey long-eared is very rare and um, it's, for people who are 
a practice identification it is is worth bearing in mind perhaps not so much in north wales but if you don't look you don't find really um, but I, I, because it's not really known in in wales i wouldn't expect to find it in in north wales the next group um i've put two two groups together really there's the myote species um and the barber still the 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 four myote species I've put on this slide are the most commonly found ones and you could find those absolutely anywhere in North Wales pretty much. So um, the, the, one, the bottom left one is the Natura's bat which has a very distinctive white tummy. Uh, the Dorbentons does to some extent, that's the one in the, the middle. And then the, the bottom right one is a young possibly whiskered or Brant's bat. And they all look relatively similar and if you're if you've, you're not familiar with the identification features and they all look possibly similar to pipistrels as well so the the pipistrel or small myotis groups um, can easily be confused um, and there can be difficulty in separating them out in the hand if you see them in flight or in in um, uh, detector records because of some overlap and also if you're looking at the the droppings it, 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 they are quite similar as well so if you submitted a record of a bat as a my a pipistrelle or small myotis species i think that that could be a reasonable um identification the the other two um myotis bats myotis means mouse eared which is um they're all similar ear shapes but very different lengths. Um, Beckstein's bat has um, the very long ears and can be confused with the long eared if you're not familiar with them. The distribution is shown on here which is, is very limited in Wales so if your uh, bat detector automatically identifies a, bat, a Beckstein's bat which they do it's probably wrong if you're in, in North Wales. Um, we wouldn't really expect them to be found in this area at all and the um, Barberstell bat, which is the, the one that's a photograph of, is very distinctive little uh, blackish coloured bat with, with a very unusual ear structure and face. So they, if you saw one of those close up, they are quite distinctive. We still don't really understand their distribution in Wales. There are certain places um, where they are known to be breeding in, in the southeast and the southwest, and they're, they're very much associated with um, old growth forest um, and we think we've got them well we've got records that from detectors in North Wales but we've never actually found an individual animal we've never managed to catch one so it's difficult to know what their status is here and Alcathoe's bat is a, is a similar to one of the whiskered bats and it's only relatively recently been identified as a British species and we haven't got any records of that in Wales as far as I know to date so again um, another one that's associated with old growth forestry um, woodlands we, we could possibly have it but we don't know yet and then I've grouped the big bats together because um, in terms of recording, it can be useful to submit a record of big bats because, um, as I'll sort of say a little bit later on, detectors can mix the, the, the species up. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the distribution, I've taken this from the, Snowdonia, the, sorry, the North Wales Mammal Atlas and I've changed the resolution slightly because if we do the noctual bat at the 10 kilometre resolution, it's just a whole load of um, squares covered up and you can't really see see the map at all um, but you, you can see that it's um, some of it the um, gaps are due to lack of recording activity but there also is a, a genuine um, lowland distribution for this species so they're they're a big bat fly fairly early in the evening look a bit swift like and if you see one of those or two of those then chances are it is, it is a nocturnal bat because the, the Lysa's bat, um, which has a similar type of habit, um, is, is very rare and it's only, we only got a hand, less than a handful of records. That's a species that's um, common in Ireland where they don't have nocturnal bats and I suspect at least one of the records was an animal that had, had come over possibly on a ferry because it was found at Holyhead. Um, and again, these are the jury's out a bit out on those the status in Wales, but I don't, yeah, 
difficult to know what, what their status is in, in North Wales, whether we just have some odd, odd migrant bats. And serotine is an, an interesting one that Sam is really the expert on for that species. That was a species that has a very southern distribution and was a, a complete surprise really to, to find some odd records up here and, and a breeding roost which, which Sam found from, from doing trapping. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of effort involved in identifying some of these species um, to confirm them and generally with bat detect records if it's a species that is very rare or hasn't been recorded I personally wouldn't um, uh, agree that a, a, a of a positive record just from a bat detector record um, because there's so much variability in, in the record you'd need to see an animal in hand to to actually identify it properly. And then the horseshoe bats I mean these are very distinctive the the photograph in the middle is, is a, a lesser horseshoe bat and the greater horseshoe bat is very similar but bigger and um, if you see them in a shed or underground if they're a bit distant it isn't obvious which you know what size they are unless you get two together which is quite unusual um, but uh, lesser horseshoes um, are not uncommon the, the, and it's North Wales is a really good area for them so it's not that they're a common species if you look at the the UK distribution they're very very westerly but they really love the um, well wooded river valleys of, of North Wales and as you can see by the, the distribution map on the left, that that's, um, does reflect their distribution, that there are sort of hot spots where, which are really good. And also a lot of those are special areas of conservation for the species. Greater horseshoe bats, we've got a few records. I don't think we've got any breeding ones actually within the counties of North Wales, but they're there is a small breeding colony that's relatively close. But we do have um, we do pick them up most often in underground hibernation sites when we're looking, monitoring the lesser horseshoe sites. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're very interesting. And we've, we have got records of a couple of ringed ones that turned up in the north of the Conway Valley, which had been um, born in roosts in the forest of Dean and probably used river valleys to travel their way up here. And we know, we know this because we, they were ringed. Um, we, the other animals that are not ringed, we don't really know where they've come from. Um, so it could be that they've also come up from, from that area or they could have come up from the, one of the strongholds in, in um, Pembrokeshire or Carmarthenshire. We don't, we don't really know. Um, so you, there's certainly a possibility of recording them, but generally if you, if you see a horseshoe bat, it's more, much more likely to be a lesser horseshoe bat. And the reason we have, as, as, as Ashley said, we've got sort of a lot of records of though, that's because we've had a monitoring scheme going on for, well, we've been monitoring for 30 years now. So there are an awful lot of records of, of those bats. Legal restrictions in very simple terms, avoid disturbing protected species or doing anything to their breeding site or resting place unless you have a license or have sought advice from NRW. And disturbance in, in, for bats includes entering a roost when bats are present, shining lights on them or on the root ent roost entrance or photographing them. And basically avoid doing anything that may alter the animal's behaviour. Um, the, the legislation is, is much more complicated than that. But I think if you just stick to thinking, am I going to disturb this bat, this bat or this animal? Is it going to change what it's doing because I'm here? Then it's probably better not to do it. You can watch bats emerging from a roost or survey them in the field without causing any disturbance. So that's the type of um, activity that we, we tend to encourage. And there are new considerations in terms of COVID that um, we've, we've heard sort of some horror stories about people being terrified of bats because they could get COVID. But in fact, we are more worried as mammal people about the risk of passing COVID from people to mammals um, and then you could end up with a, a new variant coming out of that that's transmissible back again and there has been a case people may be familiar with of, of um, the mink farms in Denmark where humans pass the, the disease to, to the animals so we are now restricted as, as bat workers in, in what we can do 
in terms of our field work. So we avoid being in close proximity to bats where possible if we do have to have close contact and it's unavoidable, which is generally for, for bat workers is um, if we have any, if we have an injured bat to deal with. Um, so we should be wearing masks to reduce the risk of transmission. And always it's a good idea to avoid handling bats, um, and, but if you have to, to remove it from a, a, a inside your house when it shouldn't be there or something, um, then wear gloves and, and a mask. And also the BCT Bat Conservation Trust has got on the, they've got a video with really good guidance for contain, how to contain a bat if you find one in your house. And also people who regularly handle bats, which are bat carers and researchers should be rabies vaccinated. So those are those sort of general health and safety considerations. And now I'm going to go on to identifying recording and I'm split that up into seeing bats in flight, watching bats emerge from a roost, what to look for if you have a close view of a bat and then using a bat detector. So seeing bats in flight, it, identification is difficult without a detector and there may be more than one species present. But if you can record the location, the direction of flight, the number of bats, if there's, if it's possible, and add any comments on the bats behaviour, then, then that can be a useful record, even if you don't know the species. So if you see regularly or even on one occasion, a, a stream of bats travelling one direction at dusk, that suggests that they're coming from a roost to go off to, to feed. <clears throat> so that, that is useful information, even if you don't know what the, the species is. And you can backtrack by going a little bit earlier in the evening and going a little bit further the direction the bats come from and seeing if you can track where they're coming from. And if you see one or two bats patrolling along the hedgerow backwards and forwards, then that's indicating foraging behaviour. So that's, that's something that you can tell even if you don't know the species. Um, you may be able to record the rough height of the flight, which would be indicative of species, even if it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't identify them. And, and whether they're large bats or small, it's a bit, bit of a Father Ted um, discussion that are they close or far away. But sometimes you can tell that a bat is noticeably large, particularly if you've got two or more species around together. And whether the, the, the type of uh, flight, if it's pipistrels, there'll be more fast and flitty, or if it's open, swift light flight over open fields is more likely to be an octal bat. And one of the easier examples, if you go somewhere like a, a river or a still river or a lake and you see Dorbenton's bats, they, they almost look like they're skating across the surface of the water and you sometimes can see their underside is, is white. Uh, whereas pipistrels would be flying about, you know, six foot or so above above the water. So those are some differences that you might be able to tell. And if you're submitting that information in the comments of a just as a bat record, but with that information, then it could indicate the species. If you're watching bats from a root roof, this is really good um, information. It's sort of the gold standard in a way, really, um, because then you've got the location of the roost. And if you can give any observations about the flight characteristics and direction, even if you don't know the species, then that's helpful. And um, if you record the time of emergence and the number of bats emerging, the time can be an indicator of which species it is. Generally, some species don't come out until it's almost too late to, to see them. But if you if you can see them, it does depend on the location. Um, it, it, it can be an indication as well. Um, if you've got permission, photograph the exit points or give an indication of the area of exits, which can be useful information. And if you watch at dawn, you get a better view and you may even see dawn swarming where bats will kind of fly around in, in large numbers before they go back into the roost and you get a good view of them. And always bear in mind there may be more than one species present. If, if there are early bats coming out, um, it's possible you might be able to record them on a, a camera or a phone um, and that's, that's useful information as well, but don't illuminate the roost. So if you see bats in a roost, we're not encouraging people to go looking for them, but if you do happen to see them, these are some sort of pointers as to what species they might be. So there's the long-eared bats, the pipistrels or small myota species or lesser horseshoe are the ones that you're more likely to see. Um, 
so obviously those are the ones that live in trees are you're not going to generally see them because they're tucked up in holes and a lot of the bats do tend to be roosting in crevices so it's difficult to see them unless they're in an open roof void um, like a barn or sometimes a loft or, or underground in winter but we don't tend to get pipistrelles underground but we do get the the top picture is, is some small myotis bat species and the lower one is the the middle one is lesser horseshoe and the bottom one is natteras and sometimes you that's the, the only view you'll get of a, a bat in a crevice but if you can just make any description of it graph of it for identification purposes and then if you see bats at close range you can get an indication um, of the the size sorry um the age uh, by the if they're young ones by the amount of fur they've got on so these are some pictures of nocturnal pops the first one is is quite young and it's just hardly got it's just got we've got sort of say a suede like um covering of fur and then the next one um is a, a few weeks later where the fur has grown um and I'm showing a picture of me with a bat in my hand, not wearing gloves. So it's an old picture. We don't do that these days. We always wear gloves, just as a reminder. Um, so bat pups are born around anywhere between late May, um, early July, depending on the season and the species. Outside that time, you, you may see a juvenile in um, August, but after that time there, there will be adults so we often get people saying they found a baby bat any time of the year because they don't realise that adult bats are so small and the on the right hand side is the size of an adult pipistrelle and the small myotis species are a, a similar size to that and they don't they always look a lot bigger when they're in flight so people will think there might be two different species seeing one flying around and then seeing one on the ground um, because the, when the wings are open, they are much larger. And then if you if you do happen to see one, this is if you found an injured one or a dead bat, um, these are the sort of features to look for. And there is a submission system for dead for submitting dead bats that are found. So if, if you do find one, get in touch with somebody fairly quickly and we can tell you how to, to submit the sample or if not, the, the, it's really good to take some photographs of it if, you, if you're happy doing that. And um, the sort of features that you're looking at is the, um, the size of the bat, so something with a scale. Um, the quality of the fur can be an indication, the one on the right, as well as the size, that's a, a noctule which has got very glossy, smooth fur. The middle one is probably a, a, a I can't think, I can't remember now whether that was a natteras or whiskered looking at it, but it's very sort of fuzzy fur. And the one on the left is, is a pipistrelle. And um, you can see this is not a feature that most people would be familiar with or were able to look at, but just where my finger is, there's um, a little flap of skin, which is called a post calcareal lobe, which is one way of telling the pipistrelles from the, the small myotis, which is something that bat workers would need to know but for, for most people I, I wouldn't expect them to be able to look at it and then ear shapes and the tragus the tragus is this little um, piece of the flap of skin in the top left hand corner that you can see in the ear of the, of the bat and the shape of those is distinctive um, on the bottom left hand side the uh, long-eared bat is showing a, a sort of fairly typical with its ears curled back in the ram's horn shape and the two bats in hibernation on the right hand side are also brown long-eared bats but they've got their ears tucked under their wings and it's just the tragus that's sticking out so those that's an often um, confusing thing when you just see a bat like that you think you don't realize it's a long-eared bat because it's the, just the tragus is looking like an ear so if you can um, photograph a, a dead bat if you find one or if you find a live bat in a house and you want some advice on doing it, it's always a good idea if you can photograph it and bear in mind the sort of features that would help um, with identification. But obviously, if it's a, a live bat, then the main thing is to um, not to distress it too much. And then out in the field, the, the sort of signs you can get, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I've not been looking at time, so I hope I'm doing OK for that. Um, 
field signs, the top left hand corner, you sometimes get staining where the bats are coming out. That's a typical uh, pipistrel uh, type of exit in the ridge of a gable apex. And below on the left hand side is the sort of signs you see of droppings where there's a large colony of bats and you'd, just, you'd find that uh, droppings on, on the window ledge or something directly below the entrance where the bats come out. And the top uh, right hand one is a single bat dropping on a door, which is um, fairly, that one is a lesser horseshoe dropping. They are comparatively distinct, but not all bat droppings are. Um, so that will indicate that a bat's either been hanging up in that porch way or going in over the, the top of the door. And the bottom right one is some wing, um, insect wings, butterfly wings and moth wings, which you typically find sometimes hanging up in, in barns attached to spiders webs where the bat's been hanging up above it and eating and dropping the wings. They're often on the floor in places like church porches are quite good places to look. Um, so you find scattering of droppings and um, the, the insect wings and it's usually brown long eards or um, lesser horseshoes or natural bats that have gone in there to, to have a feed. And then um, you get oil staining inside roofs, the left hand side one in a roof membrane, something you don't particularly want to see um, because of the possibility of um, bats getting caught up in the membranes, um, but it's a good indication of roosts. And then accumulated droppings such as the one in the middle which suggests a nursery roost. And then on the right hand side, th those are in a, a church where you get urine stains on wood or on the tiles, which is suggesting that there are bats flying around within the, the church. You find similar things to like that in, in barns as well, often on plastic sheeting, you can see urine stains. And then lastly, um, on the identifying and, and um, observing is, is bat detectors. And this could be a whole talk in itself, so I'm only going to whiz through it um, and just say there are several different types of bat detectors, heterodyne ones, you listen to the sound in real time um, and you, you identify them by comparing it with library calls or your memory of, of calls. The time expansion and frequency division and full spectrum, you listen, you can listen in real time and you record the sound and you mainly use these to produce a sonogram which you, you analyse or in the case of the little red detector, the echo meter, they do that for you instantly. And then you can get the various sound analysis programmes if you're not using something like the echo meter. Um, free programmes or free viewer versions of, of some of the professional programmes. And then I would say this is a big note of caution that the automated identification programs, um, if you read the small print that comes with them, they say, you know, don't use this as an identification feature. It just gives you an indication of, of what might be there. Um, so the, the main restrictions on them is that they're just dealing with a call that's come in. They don't know where the bats are. They're not looking at the environment. They don't know how many bats are there, they don't know what the bats are doing. And those are all things that alter the, the very variation in the echolocation call. And as a human, you can see a lot of these things when you do the analysis, but the machines, although they're very good at some parts of the analysis, they don't always pick up, like if there's two bats present, you can see that when you look at a sonogram, but uh, the, the automated systems can't tell that. And then there's a big overlap with species echolocation calls and between echolocation and social calls. So some of the big bats do low social calls, which overlap with the, sorry, do low echolocation calls, which overlap between the social calls of some of the other species. So that's something else that you, is frequently a misidentification with the, the automated programs. Um, they also need good quality recordings to compare with and they, I said they have a relatively limited reference data. They have a lot of reference data, but they haven't got every bat in every situation. So it is relatively limited. And they also work by identifying an individual pulse without the context. So I have seen a series of um, echolocation calls such as this sonogram 
and it's in, in the picture where you see a bat start off at a certain frequency and then possibly because there's another bat around it changes its frequency slightly. Um, so that identification system will often tell you that that's two different bats whereas you can see it's the same bat carrying on because you can see that the pulse continues. So they are very useful, they're really interesting but um, I, they're not reliable and they shouldn't be considered as be reliable. So I, my takeaway message is it's better to give a vague but correct record than a pre precise but incorrect one. So if your ID system says Leislers and you think, well, that's what it says, it must be right. It's, it's, it's probably not going to be right in North Wales. Um, but if you say big bat species, you probably are right, unless it's overlapping with a social call. So it's, it's not easy. And I think that's um, that's the main thing I want to say about that. As bat um, recorders and mammal recorders, we don't have time to identify people's calls. So um, I, I think it, we, we need to do further work to try and train people um, on, on doing identification themselves. So I don't I don't really want to um, get people's hopes up that they can submit a, a record with a, something that's come from their bat detector and, and the mammal recorder will have time to identify it because that's not realistic, I don't think. Um, so just going on to quickly to species monitoring, there are some projects that the National Bat Monitoring Programme runs. There's the sunset, they've changed that to just a sunset survey this year, and there's a roost count. There are others as well, and I'd suggest having a look at the, um, the, the website. And they also have online training on identification bats and information on equipment. So if, you, if you're thinking about learning about bat detecting and buying a bat detector, then it's worth having a look on there and, and using those resources. And then other further information, well, there's all, all the different groups, the, the bat groups, the North Wales Mammal Group and all the different societies and Gwyneth Bat's um, website as well. Not, there's not, not huge information on there, but you can always email us if you've, if you've got queries um, and the other, the other bat groups as well. And Facebook pages are quite useful these days for the UK Bat Workers one and there's a sound identification one as well. And that's me done. I'm going to hand you over to Sam now, who's going to explain some more details about mammal recording and cover some different groups other than bats, which might make a bit of a change, eh, Sam? You, you yeah, to... I'm not sure how I feel about this, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll give it a go. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to have to talk about some, some non-winged uh, mammals for a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of groups and then Martin's going to talk about uh, uh, um, a few groups and going to give a very brief um, overview of all the different species and different ways of surveying for them. There's a lot of species terrestrial mammal wise uh, so it is going to be very much a, a whistle top stop tour uh, so we're not going to be able to get much time to go into depth into any of the, uh, the species really. Um, but actually, yeah, sorry, I should have started with that. My name's Sam. I am the uh, county recorder for Mary Oniv and the uh, bat recorder for Cluid, um, as well as the chair for North Wales Mammal Group and the projects officer for Cluid Bat Group. Um, so, yeah, so uh, if you're interested in recording mammals, there's a lot of different uh, uh, um, guides and reference materials that you can get hold of, uh, um, either online or, or published uh, uh, um, paper uh, uh, um, books, such as some of the ones that are on the screen here, either in terms of general mammal information, uh, uh, the distributions, uh, um, information about them, or, or surveying for them. So all sorts of publications you can, you can get hold of. Um, a lot of the information I'm going to talk about today actually comes from the state of mammals in, in Wales in terms of their populations and uh, uh, status within Wales and distributions uh, and their, their red listing. Um, now, this publication uh, really wouldn't have been possible without uh, mammal records in the first place. So, you know, uh, 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 um, a lot of statistics were used to work out ranges and distributions and population numbers, um, etc. And, and really all this 
this is 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 key uh, um, for records collected from local record centres to feed in in centrally. Uh, and this this project was actually uh, um, from a few years ago, uh, 2018. It was published um, as the the review of uh, uh, um, mammals in in the UK, uh, a large central uh, uh, um, project uh, coordinated by Mammal Society and and the different agencies. Um, but uh, a year or two after that, or just after that, we decided to do a, a Wales uh, a kind of specific summary. Um, and then so late last year, this was published um, and you can download a free copy of it uh, from the Mammal Society website or you can request uh, via an email address that's on that website uh, to be posted a uh, free paper. Uh, um, hard copy of this as well. So lots of interesting uh, uh, information about each species and species accounts, uh, for, uh, um, a page for each, each species. It's completely bilingual. Uh, and it's also got some some positives because obviously there's 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 some really kind of quite depressing messages within within this, and we've tried not to make it too depressing. There are case studies of 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 positive works that have had uh, uh, good impacts on on mammals within there as well so it's not hopefully not all doom and gloom um, when we look at some how some of our species are declining um, but also you know it's, it's a look at what we can do about it so uh, highly recommend getting a copy of that if you're at all interested in in, in mammals uh, and the other thing is we mentioned a number of times uh, uh, before but uh, um, North Wales Mammal Group's website hosts the Covenod powered uh, North Wales Mammal Atlas uh, and this is really good um, if you want to know what's in your local area or what uh, mammals are, are in North Wales um, but you know if, if, if you're wondering uh, um, what's, what's in your garden or what's in your, your local community you can zoom right in you can have a look through the different species you know if you've recorded something you're like well how, how unusual is that you can really see uh, um, what records are well so uh, highly recommend you have a look at that it's available via the North Wales Mammal Group website and there's a link within that to, uh, straight into the ORS to add your mammal records as well um, so we'll jump into the species accounts and start off with Lagomorph so the the European rabbit and brown hare uh, there is a, another one in the UK the the, the, the uh, mountain hare but uh, I know Martin's got a, 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 a possible record over in the north east um, but unconfirmed so really we're gonna stick to the the ones that are most likely to be here to, to give a bit more of information on um, so yeah the rabbit if you look at the records uh, um, within in Covenant you can see it's a widespread species uh, across North Wales as you'd expect um, and a uh, However, the interesting thing, if you look at on the, the, the red listing, is actually a near threatened species. This is um, probably uh, um, uh, an oddity about the way that the, the data is and about how the populations fluctuate. So we've got a downward trend um, within them. Um, and this is uh, um, probably because actually we don't really have good data over time on what their populations are doing. A lot of it's based on game bag, but also we know that, that various diseases, including mixomatosis, um, have a heavy uh, a part to play in, in population dynamics of, of uh, rabbits. Um, and so we do see these fluctuations. Um, but and then if we go on to the hair you'll see that again widespread uh, um, uh, uh, records um, across North Wales but actually from this you'd think that, that the uh, the hare was a, a far more common uh, beast than the, uh, the the rabbit um, however obviously we know that there's a lot smaller population um, data deficient on trend so we don't really know what's what's happening with trend but this is a, probably simply a reflection of a, a recorder effort you know if you see a hair that's interesting and you make the record on on Covenod, but with a rabbit you don't really bother so you know this is a good case in point of you know why why records are important um and you know uh, um that you know we need you to submit records even if it's a, a, a you know a common species or something that you wouldn't think of um as being that relevant you know as such as the rabbit um you know not just the, the interesting species obviously we want those as well but 
so if we uh, just think about the, the the identification between the two, so we get a lot of records for hair that um, come away for verification, and uh, sometimes it's quite tricky to know um, whether the person has seen a hare or a rabbit, you know, uh, from a distance. They could look quite similar you don't know who the person is or, or you know what experience they've got uh, so you know I'll run through some of the identification features of a lot of these species and, and as a kind of overall for all mammals um, when you're entering your records uh, a plea for as much information as you can so uh, so for example with the, the, the hair the ears are twice as long as their head um, and they have black tips and the base of the on, on the top of the tail is also black uh, they're much larger animal with longer legs um, while as with their rabbit their brown tips to their ears uh, white on top of the tail and the ears are roughly as long as their, their head um, if you can put that kind of information in the comments of your records then we know actually not just seen seen uh, a, a like more but actually you've seen key identification features um, so that we know that you know it's a good record and we can happily confirm those um yeah and as i say that's the same for all, all mammals that i really talk about when we talk about the the key features if you can stick you know what you've seen that's you know kind of made you uh, prove the point as to what uh, 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 you, you've seen it really does help us verify them just moving on uh, to uh, droppings, other ways you can identify, you don't just have to see the animal themselves, um, you might just see droppings, um, so you can see the droppings for hairs on the right here, about twice the size and, and normally a more golden colour than rabbits. Uh, with rabbits uh, you might find the burrows, um, they're normally between 8 and 14 centimetres large and one of the, the ways that you can also, wide, uh, one of the other ways that you can kind of quite often tell that it's a rabbit burrow as well is that rabbits are, um, will often leave droppings on top of the uh, the spoil heaps outside. Um, so that's a, a good indication uh, uh, um, that it could well be rabbit. Uh, hares don't uh, dig burrows, they just have little forms um, uh, in, in the grass and they're probably there probably harder to, to identify they almost look like someone's kind of skidded with their, their foot sometimes but uh, but sometimes you know if you're you're experienced in, in spotting those you can put those in as a record as well again photographs would be really useful for, for the recorders as well uh, okay, so we'll move on to insectivores. Uh, first up, hedgehog. Uh, so you can see actually, again, a widespread species across North Wales, uh, um, particularly Anglesey, seems to have really good numbers. Um, this is a species that is being uh, listed as vulnerable within Wales and, and, and GB uh, with a population that is decreasing um, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, our, one of them, it's very obvious on, on the maps where you can pretty much pick out our road networks via the uh, the, the records that are in, in Covnod. Um, and that is essentially because uh, uh, um, road casualties are a really good way of recording uh, uh, hedgehogs. You can often pick them up on on, on roads uh, as you're driving along. And so a lot of records come from that. And it's a good place to, to, to pick those up. Uh, hard to uh, obviously, uh, I won't go into identification details on, on, on hedgehogs. I think, yeah, they're pretty, pretty obvious. Um, but one of the things that people do seem to struggle with is identification of of hedgehog uh, um, droppings, hedgehog scats, um, which seem to to either yeah be confused with other things or, or people just not sure what they are when they when they first see them. Uh, but they are this usually uh, this dark blue black appearance, um, uh, apparently with a, a hint of linseed oil on the smell to them, um, and. Uh, uh, um, you can pick out the fragments of insects that they've been eating within within the uh, the kind of uh, dropping as well. So that's something to look for. Um, more recently, uh, rather than just uh, uh, looking for dead ones, uh, looking for live ones can be nice as well. Uh, they pick up well on camera traps, uh, as do a lot of other species, but uh, um, hedgehogs you can pick up on camera traps quite readily. Um, they follow small linear features within the landscape often, so if you put it along the base of a wall they'll often be walking there. Um, and also what we now use as well is hedgehog tunnels. So this is a, a sheet of corrugated uh, plastic uh, uh, um, boarding uh, folded into uh, um, a triangular tunnel shape and what we do is put a sheet of paper on each side uh, um, and whoops, sorry and a uh, ink pad 
in the middle um and uh, a bait sorry ink pad on e either side of, of bait that goes in the middle in this case we use hot dogs they seem to very much like hot dogs um and you put it along a, a linear feature such as a, a wall and uh, hedgehogs following along like to go through and the very distinctive uh, uh, footprints which are e yeah, easy to identify often you'll get uh, lots of mice and uh, 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 so other small mammals walking over the top of it or even cats uh, we've had before as well but uh, um, the hedgehog footprints are, are, are quite obvious and, and, and clear um, so you can pick those out uh, next up, uh, uh, mole. I'm not going to dwell on this. I think everybody kind of uh, fairly very familiar with with moles. Um, mole hills are obviously an easy thing to to detect at a glance in within the the landscape. Um, but having said that, you know we're pretty sure that they're almost everywhere, even in you know uplands you can see them. Um, but uh, uh, relatively few uh, records uh, within Covnod um, on um, for North Wales. And again, this is probably the fact that it's a common species. So people don't really think to, to record it. Um, but as you can see, we've got no trend data on what the population is doing, um, probably because a lot of people just don't don't uh, record uh, uh, the humble mole. Um, uh, next up in sectors is the common shrew, pygmy shrew, and water shrew. So I'll talk about these in the kind of a, a group. So the um, both the common and uh, pygmy shrew. Uh, if you look at the records within Covnod, very few and far between. In fact, actually, uh, um, this has led to when the, the review of, of mammals was done, that the clean is left out of the distribution um, of them um, because there's just not enough records. I know there's, there's this one uh, on the clean for, for common, but the way that the statistics works is that it, that would have been excluded as a, a random outlier. And so, yeah, we're actually missing areas, and and that's not because they're not going to be there. It's because the records uh, um, aren't there. Um, so yeah, please, you know, to 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 please do do submit records, <laughs> no matter how common or uninteresting you might think they are. You know, the data is really useful. Um, so we don't have any concern about the population of these really, but but we um, yeah, information is always useful. Um, so if we think about the, the identification features um, uh, um, of these, uh, here we've got a picture of the, the, the two together, and I'll come on to, to the water shoe in just a moment. But um, the, the two shoes, common pygmy, um, when it comes to the common, uh, it, they're three-toned. So you've got a dark brown on top, lighter on the sides, and even lighter on, on the, the stomach, while as the pygmy shoe is much smaller. It has a far more domed head um, and a proportionally longer tail. So you can see uh, uh, um, that uh, compared to the body length, uh, the, the pygmy shoe, tail there is a lot longer um, and the pygmy shrew is is two-toned so it's it's uh, um, back and sides are a fairly similar paler brown color and its uh, belly is 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 lighter um, the water shrew uh, is far more distinctive between the other two where you can see in the picture above and, and this diagram uh, uh, that uh, it is a, a very dark uh, dark uh, black uh, fur on its top with a silvery grey uh, belly fur and that colouring continues all the way along the tail as well so it's a pale base to the uh, um, underside to the tail as well uh, connected to uh, um, you know associated with water bodies uh, um, with still water um, uh, and is much larger uh, animal but much more obvious but um, probably a lot less well it is a lot less common uh, as well and um, we do have these big gaps in in distribution um, as well uh, uh, from the records um, but a lot harder to record really these uh, these individuals so how do we go about recording them well uh, uh, cats for all those cat owners out there they're actually a really good uh, um, uh, <laughs> mammal surveyor are, are cats uh, so when they bring in um, uh, uh, their, their their prey, uh, small mammals that they've caught, and yeah, this is is not just for shoes, but for other small mammals as well. Um, it's often a good opportunity to see what they brought in, and you know, uh, if people can identify what small mammals their cats have brought in, then uh, and submit those records. They're they're really useful as well because obviously 
obviously otherwise uh, you might not see them but your cat certainly does and find them uh, we can use the traditional uh, kind of trapping methods for such as uh, this longworth trap here up on the top right um, i just have to mentioned that they are protected in the wildlife and countryside act uh, they're a schedule six species which means that certain methods of taking and killing are prohibited you can download a general license uh, from nrw and you follow the advice given and uh, that 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 uh, solves the, the kind of illegal uh, um, uh, issue uh, but we strongly recommend that if you're going to do this that you get some training come out with the local mammal group who can show you how to use these traps safely uh, shrews have a very fast metabolism and if uh, they're not kind of baited right uh, you do get mortality within the the trap some traps have shrew holes cut in them so you can't catch them but they that's also associated with a level of mortality where other animals try and try and escape so they're a good survey tool but need to be used in the right way so again you know uh, definitely recommend uh, training with that the uh, water shrew however is actually uh, a really safe and easy way of, of monitoring for those so if you put these little plastic bait tubes you can see in the bottom left there's no legal implications for these you simply put the uh, the tubes out next to your water bodies uh, next to your garden pond uh, whatever it might be um, with some uh, 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 bait in there so either mealworms or, or casters and the uh, water shoes will enter those eat and uh, fast metabolism so they, they 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 will often leave droppings behind as they're eating um, and then you can look at those droppings and identify uh, uh, aquatic invertebrate remains in those which gives a really good indication that it's it's water shoot so good survey technique the other way of uh, uh, um, obviously identifying small mammals is by doing owl pellet dissection so owls as well as cats are excellent mammal surveyors um, and uh, obviously uh, uh, hunting and predating on them uh, they regurgitate the indigestible uh, uh, hair and bone and if we collect these and, and probably a word of warning as well that that uh, nest sites particularly um, after the barn owl are, are protected but um, you know we there are sources of these from bird uh, uh, recorder friends etc and, and if you know the location where the pellets were collected then you know that within uh, the area that that bird was was uh, hunting that uh, these species might occur uh, and so you can find a number of small mammals, not just uh, the, the insectivores, uh, the shrews within these pellets. But for shrews, uh, their skulls are very distinctive with this elongated shape uh, that is common, but with, with pygmy, you'd have more of a domed uh, um, uh, uh, skull shape on it. Um, and then you can look at dentition. So there's lots of guides. Um, out there that you can freely download um, to look at uh, 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 um, you, you don't need a magnifying glass or, or well, magnifying glass is helpful but you certainly don't need a microscope or anything they're obviously quite large and you can identify the the teeth and the jaws and, and the skulls within those to figure out what uh, uh, the owls are eating and therefore what mammals are in the area so with the the common shrew up at the top here you can look at the the yeah it's the dentition um and the relative length of two uh, uh, uh teeth um to figure out which which species it is and the size of that lower jaw as well uh, uh um pygmy in the middle um, and you can see the dentition and the relative size of teeth uh, uh, varies um, and again the water shrew down at the bottom is a very distinctive lower jaw and, and upper jaw for a shrew uh, to move on to uh, small sorry I'm going quite fast though but <laughs> conscious of trying not to, to, to take up too much time um, but uh, yeah onto small mammals so we start off with hazel dormouse so hazel dormouse really is a, a, a quite distinctive and an amazingly beautiful little animal uh, like character within them um, and obvious to identify when you actually see them with this lovely ginger color and, and their bushy tails it's small mouse um, but uh, uh, um, very unusual that you'd actually see them out in the open like this um they are vulnerable and uh decreasing in population um within wales um and have a very uh, kind of patchy distribution of where they're found As you can see from the the covenod records this isn't uh, uh necessarily under under recording it is that they're quite limited populations um that said we you know there, there may well be other areas that they they're in and we haven't found them um and so yeah do encourage the, the uh, uh, um to recording effort for them 
so how do you go about recording them where well, you can set out uh, nest boxes and uh, uh, nest tubes um, in suitable habitat so you know you might have big hazel stools and you strap the boxes on and you look for their nests which are distinctive woven balls um, within them um, uh, I'll cover legals in a second but uh, actually uh, one of the I'm sorry say there are lots of well not lots there are nest box schemes within North Wales and groups that go out and, and uh, look for and survey uh, for dormice uh, so this isn't necessarily something that you do on your own uh, but uh, you know that you'd go out with a, a, a group and go and do however nut hunts is a really effective way of, of picking up dormouse and there's uh, uh, no restrictions on that in terms of legalities um, and the nuts that you can find are, are, are quite distinctive so with a dormouse they leave teeth marks around the outside of the nut hole where they've, they've chewed their way in so there's teeth marks around the outside and on the the edge of the the cut they kind of scoop out uh in a sideways kind of motion as in a twisting turning motion they just scoop out the side so you can see very distinctive kind of uh, lines going round uh, uh um, the entrance into the the, the nut so uh yeah quite easy to to well, you can, <laughs> and easier with practice, identify who's eaten uh, what nut. Uh, but yeah, uh, the the big thing here to say is dormouse are protected under uh, 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 the Habitat Regs and uh, Schedule Five of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. I won't go into the detail of that, um, but it's there. Um, and so essentially, the nest box checks type surveys and uh, are you need a license to undertake those. Um, and if you did that without a license, you you may well be uh, uh, committing offence. Um, hence, why joining in with existing schemes is the way to do that but no survey license is required for nut hunts so yeah thoroughly uh, encouraged that you find a big stool of hazel and scrape around in the leaf litter in there and pick out the nuts and you'll be able to to look at the way that they've been eaten um, identify the species and I'll talk about uh, the species uh, as we go through them and how you identify the different nuts um, uh, um, and what mammals have, have eaten them. Uh, so we'll jump on to, to bank vole and field vole. So two of our common, uh, commonest uh, uh, mammals really. Uh, but again, if you look in the, the records for Covnod, uh, very limited uh, uh, records within there. Um, uh, they can be a bit tricky to tell apart uh, without practice, but um, the bank vole, uh, has a, 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 a longer tail proportionally, so the tail is 50% of its body length, the ears are more obvious, um, and uh, uh, it, it's dark on top uh, and uh, on the tail, and the, the bottom side of the tail is, is white, so if you get to see them, if your cat brings one in, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're quite obvious from, from that point of view. With the field vole, the ears are far more hidden away into the fur, the less obvious, the tail is proportionally shorter, so about 30% of the body length, um, it's, uh, and its tail is is pale brown all over so it's not this this two-tone uh, color um, again cats really good way of uh, detecting uh, uh, voles so you know if you can identify them please do submit the records that way uh, with bank voles uh, they eat nuts uh, a lot die and uh, they're quite distinctive when you find a nut whether it's been eaten by a bank vole because unlike the the Dormouse that we looked at before, they leave no teeth marks around the outer edge of the the, the, the entrance hole, as it were, um, and they chisel straight down into the 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 through the nut into uh, through the nut shell to get to the nut inside. Um, so those straight chisel marks are quite distinctive. Um, the Field vole. I haven't got any pictures of this in, in the presentation, but uh, um, they are, are similar to the water vole, which we'll talk about next. Um, in terms of, they have uh, feeding stations. Um, so if you part long grass tussocks in a field um, and uh, look in the base of it, often you can find short little bits of of cut grass and uh, uh, reeds that are stripped of their outer outer green um, and they'll leave those behind in little little piles um, a couple of centimeters long 
and uh, they also have little latrines and, and runs through the grass so the latrines are, are, are small few normal quite often fairly bright green uh, droppings and um, little pellets uh, um, that are just a few millimeters long and, and little little piles where they, they've latrined. Uh, again, small mammals, uh, so again, uh, the voles are, are, are well picked up by owls. So during the dissection of, of pellets, you can find the skulls, uh, which are very distinctive, um, particularly from their molar teeth, which are these kind of serrated little uh, um, combs. Uh, and again, uh, using the guides you can pick out the, the teeth and look at what uh, whether they're bank vole or, or field vole within those. Uh, we'll move on to, to water vole. Water vole is probably one of our most endangered uh, 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 um, rapidly declining species in in Wales and, and Britain uh, and uh, if we're not careful it's likely to go extinct I think uh, within our lifetimes um, and so you know uh, a lot of uh, 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 conservation positive action required for water vole uh, to halt that trend. There are, uh, I put two maps from Covnod in here, uh, just to kind of underline that. The one at the bottom is all records, uh, so includes the historic records, and the one in the top is the more recent records. Uh, I can't remember what year that, that was after. Um, but uh, but yeah, you can see that, that a lot less records coming in and, and recently. We've got a couple of, of strongholds for them uh, up in some of the uplands, such as Mignant, uh, where you can see that in the, the top map. Uh, and uh, Anglesey is also a, a key site for them. Um, but recently, we've resurveyed a number of these sites and, and uh, um, water voles are disappearing from them, uh, which is uh, yeah rather worrying. Um, they're relatively easy to identify. Uh, the this is a feeding station, just uh, I was describing for the, the field vole, but this is the water vole, and they're normally right on the water's edge. So this is within, I think, a bed of Phragmites, and you'll find uh, um, the, the feeding remains that they leave um, in these little feeding stations are uh, eight dead centimeters long, and they have quite a distinctive uh, 45 degree cut uh, from the way that they've, they've eaten them on the ends. Um, You'll see little runs going along the, the edge and they also latrine. So the picture in the bottom left, a little pile of, of, of uh, water vole droppings, which are quite distinctive. They're odorless, unlike rats. So, you know, if you're, you're confused, give it a sniff and, and you'll regret rat, but uh, water vole are uh, uh, odorless. Uh, uh, they're normally a, a green, dark green color um, and about a centimeter in size. Uh, um, and these nicely formed pellets. Uh, again, uh, water vole are legally protected uh, under the Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, but generally it's the burrows that are, 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 are protected. So um, while as you can go out and look for the feeding signs, the latrines and walk along uh, within the river or on the, the bank side looking for those signs, um, the legal issues come in if you start peering into burrows and, and interfering with burrows then then that that uh, they are protected um so while as you can go out and, and survey for water well, we do strongly recommend that uh, yeah you come along on on the mammal group uh, um training course uh, survey to get some some experience on spotting the signs and and, and how to approach these things uh, before you undertake water vol surveys really um so we move on to harvest mouse. Uh, as you see, very few records uh, within uh, North Wales. This is a species that has been searched for actively. Um, they're quite hard to to and um, labour intensive to survey for. They're a vulnerable species with a very uh, uh, fragmented uh, uh, distribution. Um, they're quite charismatic, and you're often associated with their cornfields and this amazing. Uh, 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 prehensile tail that can wrap around and help them move through the uh, the stalks of corn so the, the black and white image there is you know often uh, the, the kind of typical uh, uh, um, image of them within within reeds or corn where the nest is suspended off the ground um, and is an intricately woven ball that's about a tennis ball size um, as I say uh, 
they are hard to find uh, and quite intensive in terms of labor to, to try and find them. So you can see the bottom left is a, 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 sorry, a group of people trying to undertake a, a search. Some of the nests, they're different type of nests. Some are winter and, and little hammocks. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, we, we there are also uh, surveys that you can go out and join in on these to uh, to get your eye in and learn a bit more about them and and, and the survey techniques. Um, so yeah, the typical one is is suspended, but actually the top right photo there is actually a harvest mouse uh, nest on Hullock Dunes, where it's just in the base of a, a clump of uh, grass. So they're not always suspended. Um, more recently, one of the, the ways that we've been surveying for them is using uh, another form of bait pot. Uh, so uh, uh, um, this person is uh, putting out bait pots uh, suspended on canes above the ground so that as the harvest mouse move through the, the higher vegetation, um, there is food within that pot. They go in, eat, hopefully leave a scat, uh, which can then be uh, uh, assessed by DNA. So that's a, a new way of picking those up. Um, so other small mammals, wood mouse, yellow nate mouse and, and house mouse. Uh, so uh, uh, with the, the yellow nate mouse, uh, there are very few records, uh, well, virtually no records in uh, North Wales, uh, although Martin told me yesterday that he got one uh, from near Gregbechan of a possible one. So again, where we don't have records, uh, um, as much as Jean said, you know, sometimes it's, it's seek and you'll find. Uh, if you don't look, you won't know there. And also keeping an open mind about what, what might be moving, what might be arriving into the area or what might have been overlooked, um, particularly with, you know, potentially harder to identify species that people aren't, aren't, aren't used to seeing. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, yellow neck in theory, not here, but they're quite distinctive with uh, this, this uh, uh, joined band across their chest that you can see in the photo there of, of yellow and, and relatively large ears. Um, the wood mouse um, and the house mouse have a quite an interesting dynamic in terms of uh, um, people who actually have uh, mice in their house. Quite often it is wood mice, not house mouse um uh, that that come in um and you can see uh, uh, um relatively few records for very rare you know for, for a relatively for common species um with the uh, um house mouse even fewer records so only a handful of records of of house mouse and, and that's often because maybe they're viewed as a pest species and people don't tend to record pest species however actually uh, you know we can but hardly any records to really know what the status of the, the house mouse is um again cats great way of, of detecting uh, uh mouse records, same as, as pellets. Um, but if we have a quick look at the identification features between uh, the, the house mouse and the uh, um, wood mouse. Um, so with the wood mouse, uh, these large ears um, uh, are, are quite distinctive. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wood mouse is kind of reddish brown as opposed to a grayish brown. Um, it's the, the smaller ears compared to the larger ears of the the wood mouse that are very useful identification feature as well and the tail the tail is probably the the obvious key one where the the tail of the wood mouse is uh, um black on top and lighter underneath uh while as the the it's brown or pink all over with some fur on the, the house mouse so yeah i really would encourage house mouse records to to be submitted um just because there's, there's so few of them uh, so again, how do we, uh, other signs and, and survey methods, so, uh, um, you know, if you've got mice in the house, um, if you, you're, you're rooting around in your attic for your suitcases and you happen to see some droppings, um, is it a bat or is it mouse? They're often confused. Well, mouse um, uh, uh, essentially won't crumble when you rub it between your fingers. If there's a bat dropping in there and you give it a little rub, you know, rub between your fingers and it, it, it turns to dust and, and it's got a bit of a shine on it, then that's going to be bat. Um, uh, with the wood mouse, uh, again, is, is is easy to identify when it's been eating nuts as well. Uh, from the teeth marks that it leaves around the outside of the hole, um, unlike the bank vole, um, but they both go straight in, so straight chisel marks, uh, teeth marks into the, the nut 
but they leave the, the, the marks on the outside as well. Again, uh, uh, trapping is a good way of picking up uh, mouse, uh, 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 but again, with uh, the proviso of the legal protections uh, uh, connected to the shrews that we talked about before. And again, uh, owl pellets, excellent way, and you can look at, at the teeth, um, and the uh, root holes within the jaws as to identify which which type of mouse it is that you've found. And last, at least uh, the <laughs> good old brown rat, very, very common, widespread species. Um, it's not even being assessed for for, for in the, within the red list, but um, you know, relatively few records um, for probably what is a, a common species. Um, but it, uh, you know, do encourage records of all, all species to be put in. Um, in fact, you know, with and we've got uh, two two species of our. Uh, Rat, the brown, which is the common one, and the black, but actually black is probably uh, essentially extinct now. Um, I haven't been here for, for a long time. It's now uh, um, thought to be extinct and very few records. Uh, in the past, there were odd records of black rats normally around shipping areas. Uh, and ports, um, but those haven't even uh, been recorded for, for uh, um, decades now. Uh, so we think uh, a black rat is probably extinct, but there's always that possibility that connected with ports uh, where ships are coming in from other places that the black rat could, could re-emerge. Uh, so yeah, uh, um, yeah, or easy to uh, uh, confuse with the, the brown rat, but um, yeah. Uh, and that is the last species I was going to talk about. So I'll hand over to uh, uh, Martin and stop sharing. Okay, so how do I follow um, Sam's talk? Lots of detail there, Sam. Uh, I'll swiftly go through this lot um, because we've taken up quite a lot of time already. Uh, so I'm gonna cover the carnivores, the deer and squirrels um, and a little bonus uh, at the end as well. Uh, so we'll start with the carnivores. So that's basically the mustelids and the fox. So the weasel family and the fox. We'll start with the badger. I'm sure most people are familiar with the badger. Uh, very easy to identify if you see its head. Other than that, it uh, can be a little tricky. The footprint uh, is worth looking at. It's like a small bear footprint and people are generally surprised at how small it is. Uh, probably about two to three inches across um, and so very small but distinctive in the in shape of it with one large horizontal pad uh, and then four pads uh, in front of that uh, in a line not curved. Um, legally protected animal um, it's an omnivore and an earthworm specialist so it basically specializes in earthworms but it will eat a huge range of different things um, found in sets which can be just one hole um, with multiple badges in or just one. You can't tell how many badges are in a, in a set by the number of holes. Um, they can be very big, these sets. I found one in North Wales with 75 holes once, which is um, quite impressive. Um, badges have distinct latrines around their territory, which are very distinctive. Um, they are basically little pits full of droppings, faeces, um, and they're used as territorial markers. Sometimes you'll find them around the set. More often you'll find them uh, around the territorial boundaries. Um, and there are survey techniques for uh, working out territorial boundaries using the latrines uh, by feeding the animals coloured bait, uh, which shows the uh, territorial boundaries quite nicely most of the time. Um, another good survey technique is to basically look along the bottom of fences um, where you've got that lower strand of barbed wire, little tunnel going underneath, the badgers will invariably leave black and white hairs um, on the, the lower strand of the barbed wire there. So that's a very distinctive feature. But the, the easiest way to find badgers is to basically follow animal paths. If you find a nice animal path, follow it, see where it goes. Um, if it's a badger path, it'll go through a set, uh, almost certainly, uh, if you follow it in the right direction, of course. Uh, so the legal aspect is the Protection of Badger Act. So you, it's illegal to kill, injure or take a badger. 
or to damage or disturb its place of shelter. So anything that disturbs uh, the badgers uh, could be an offence. Its place of shelter is its set, but a set can be anything. It can even be um, just a, an open area, uh, a couch, if you like. Um, I found one in North Wales in a shed uh, or the remains of a shed just on the floor of the shed. Um, so anywhere they, they rest, they shelter um, is their set um, and it would be illegal to disturb them or to damage that. The distribution of the badger is quite widespread. Uh, there are a few on Anglesey, not too many, um, mainly up in the northwest, and there are some down in the southeast of Anglesey, uh, or should I say the, uh, the east of Anglesey. Um, other than that, they're, as I say, widespread, uh, often on the road like hedgehogs, so there's a concentration of records along the roadsides, um, as you can see uh, down near uh, Bala. Uh, as a good example, but um, generally widespread and um, and generally well known. So most people know how to identify a badger if they see one clearly. The next one is the otter. Um, again, very widespread now. Uh, they're doing quite well. They can be found on most watercourses, if not all watercourses in Wales and certainly in North Wales. Um, also, they can be seen in the sea. Um, they're a completely different species to the sea otters in America, but um, they habitually use the sea if it's uh, on their territory. They're often killed on the roads, unfortunately, usually when the rivers are in spate and they go onto land across the roads because they can't go under the bridges uh, and then they get hit by cars. So that's a good way of recording them, but uh, rather unfortunate one. They are legally protected. Um, so again, you mustn't disturb a halt, which is where they live, uh, which is usually under tree roots and such places, uh, but can be almost anywhere. It could be in a culvert or something like that. Uh, so illegal to disturb them. The otter eats fish, frogs, other animals. Um, the distinctive uh, survey method is looking for springs, looking for their droppings, which are usually found on rocks and ledges under bridges uh, are very good places to look. Uh, they smell of apparently jasmine tea. Um, so if you have jasmine tea, that smells of otter spring. Um, they, the droppings are not unpleasant to smell. Uh, if you find a mink dropping, you'll be uh, rather sorry you sniffed it. Uh, but otter droppings smell quite pleasant um, and many of us uh, look forward to the next one we get to, get to smell because it's so nice. Uh, footprints, there's a long heel on the footprint so it looks as if almost as if the otter has slipped um, so you've got a long uh, patch and then the, uh, the four pads in, in front of that. They often slide down riverbanks, so if you find a slope uh, down into a river, down through the bank, uh, that may well be caught, uh, used by otters. Uh, so the survey tip for these ones is sniff the rocks. Um, look on the rocks in the streams, uh, look under bridges, and you'll soon find otter sprains. Have a sniff. If it smells pleasant, then that's otters. Uh, that's a picture of the footprints, just to give you an idea of, of what they look like. Uh, they're protected under the uh, protection of uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act and they're a European protected species. And if you're lucky, you'll see something like this. Notice the long tail, very long tail, pointed, uh, that's distinctive for otter. It prevents confusion with things like the mink, which are actually much smaller, but with a totally different type of tail. Uh, this is the distribution for the otter, or at least the known distribution of the otter, widespread. Pretty much every watercourse has otters and they're around the coast as well. The pine martin is um, not quite a new addition to the Welsh fauna. They used to be here. Um, I have records of them from way back in the um, late 80s, um, but they effectively died out. 
So they've been reintroduced uh, in several locations, uh, including mid Wales, which have spread throughout uh, uh, Wales and certainly up into North Wales. And there's also a population reintroduced around the Bethesda and Bangor area, which is uh, just two or three animals, I think, but they're doing quite well. Um, very low population, but they can turn up anywhere. The mid Wales population, uh, certainly some individuals from the mid Wales population, um, moved north um, up as far as Abigail and Doris. Um, then one, one particular male moved back um, down to mid Wales. He was found, I think, in Clochinog as well, um, and then eventually ended up in Derbyshire, dead on the road. Um, so that's just one individual that travelled hundreds of miles. Um, so they can turn up anywhere. The distinctive feature is they look like basically a cross between a cat and a squirrel. They've got a long bushy tail, they're chocolate brown, they've got an orange bib um, underneath uh, on the chest. Um, they climb very readily and they bounce along the road when they, when they run. So they're quite distinctive. The, the ears are a distinguishing feature because they have that pale edge. So if you see something with pale edged ears uh, that looks vaguely like a pine martin, then you could well be on the right track. Um, but this is a, an animal that we'd like to have more records of. Uh, there are quite a few out there. Um, so um, camera traps are a good way to pick them up. I've picked them up in the Gwida Forest. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's quite a few out there and there's a good chance of seeing them. Uh, legally protected, uh, like many of these rare animals. The pine martin eats a variety of things, uh, all sorts of animals, mainly small mammals, uh, eggs, rabbits, fruit, even biscuits, uh, if people put them out for them. Uh, they den in tree holes and squirrel drays and rock cavities and even in roofs. Um, many remote properties uh, have pine martins uh, denning in them, especially in areas like Ireland and Scotland. Scats are deposited along the tracks and also on tops of some bird boxes. I uh, found them on top of golden eye boxes in Scotland um, as, a, as a general habit for them. They climb trees quite readily, as I've said. The survey tip for these ones is raspberry jam. They love raspberry jam. Uh, so if you put out raspberry jam uh, for them, then uh, they're about oh, oh. Oh, awesome. Take it off. Your microphone, please, Betty. Thank you. Um, right. So Wildlife and Country Act, Countryside Act, Schedules Nine, Five and Nine. Um, it's illegal to kill, injure, or damage or destroy its uh, place of shelter. So if you find a um, a nest site or a den site, um, then you you have to leave it alone unless you've got a license. There's some footprints uh, in the snow, a distinctive five-toed print, um, almost like a little star. Um, they're reasonable size, they can't be confused with uh, small mammals like um, rodents, uh, but they're, um, they're not very big, they're an inch and a half, something like that. Um, but a very distinctive shape for the family as a whole, apart from the badger. This is the uh, current distribution map, uh, which is um, not up to date because it hasn't got the Bethesda um, pine martins. Uh, they are, as I said, in the Gwida forest, uh, which is um, you know, around the uh, Bestacoid area, Clan Roost. Um, but there aren't many records. There's a few in Klikainog, uh, one or two down uh, south of Trasvanov and a few further south, which are part of the reintroduction uh, down there. The polecat is, um, it's a, an animal that retreated to Wales from the rest of the UK. Um, it was basically extinct uh, throughout most of the UK um, and just survived in, in Wales, but now it's spread back out of its strongholds in the, in the hills of Wales. It's common and widespread throughout Wales and spreading through England as well. Uh, it hybridizes with ferrets, though. It's the ancestor of domestic ferrets. So 
quite often you will find one that doesn't look quite like this one. It maybe has a paler mask or the fur is a different color um, or, or other varieties. You get albino ferrets, um, which turn up occasionally. Um, so it's important to, to know how to distinguish from, uh, from the ferrets. It's got a distinctive uh, double uh, layered fur. The undercoat is basically pale, as you can see from this image, but the outer guard hairs are quite dark. So as it moves along, the color will change um, depending on how the light is, is, uh, is touching and refle reflecting from the coat. So um, if you get a chance to see one, um, it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, and it's a good way to distinguish them from other animals like uh, mink, which have a pretty uniform color across the whole body. Um, and again, the polecat, uh, like pine martin, has white edges to its ears, um, usually. It's a rabbit specialist, and again, it's legally protected. Uh, eats rodents, frogs, birds, sleeps in rabbit burrows after it's eaten the owners. Um, and it has that bandit mask, which you saw in the photograph. The best way to find them is use trail cameras. Um, they turn up in all sorts of places. Uh, certainly had a few around here in the real area. Uh, even one coming out of a badger set, which it may have been denning in temporarily. There's the uh, polecat footprints, which are very similar to the pine martin, but a bit smaller. Uh, the legal aspect is basically it's illegal to use traps, snares, nets or other specified devices to take or kill them. Um, so if you wanted to survey for using traps, you would need a license from NRW. This is the uh, known distribution. Um, they're pretty much everywhere in, in North Wales. Um, it would be surprising if, if there was an area that they weren't in, but assuming it's not a high top of a mountain. Uh, but even there, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, moving to the smaller um, members of the weasel family, the stoat is a gorgeous little critter, um, very widespread, but not often seen. Uh, it's famed for being able to kill uh, animals much bigger than itself. Uh, a lot of people call it the death sausage because uh, it's sausage shaped and basically is, uh, is the mark of doom for any small mammal that it comes across. Some of them turn white in the winter, in which case they're called ermine, uh, but they always have a black tip to the tail. It's a fairly long tail uh, with a black tip, usually quite bushy at the tip, um, and they're that distinctive sort of brownish colour on the top and bright white underneath, uh, usually with white feet. They're found in a wide variety of habitats, so farmland, woodland, um, pretty much anywhere except you know the really open hills um, you might find uh, stoats. They quite like um, stone walls so if you've got somewhere with a dry stone wall with lots of cavities in it then um, that would be a good place to monitor for stoats because it's ideal for them because their prey has lots of hidey holes to hide in uh, but the stoat can get in there and, and spot them. Uh, another distinguishing feature is that when they're running, they have an arched back. They kind of bound, much like some of the other mustelids, uh, which is different to the way the weasel tends to move. Uh, again, there's the distribution, quite widespread, relatively common, but not often seen, hence the, the large gaps in the uh, distribution map there. Um, so well worth recording if you see one. Weasel's much smaller than stoat. Um, the weasel is, uh, I suppose, probably only six inches long. Um, in many cases, obviously they are variable, um, but they're weaselly identified because the stoat is totally different. Um, very small tail with no black tip. Um, and they're generally small and they zip along the ground. They don't bound. You just find a, a flash of gingery colored fur going across the road maybe, um, and that's probably going to be a weasel. They hunt rodents and even rabbits, which are much, much bigger than they are. Um, 
wide variety of habitats. They're very gingery, um, so quite distinctive uh, animal, quite distinctive coloration. Um, the, there's no survey tip really for these except they need rodent rich habitats. So if you've got a rodent rich habitat, there's a very good chance you've got weasels there, but uh, they're very difficult to spot. That's the known distribution. Um, they're probably pretty much everywhere, uh, except again on the high mountain tops, but um, under recorded. So if you do know where they've been seen, then please put your records into COVNOD and we can fill in some of the gaps. The mink is a non-native um, animal, an invasive animal. It's widespread now. It's pretty much everywhere on most watercourses and uh, water bodies. It's a voracious predator of water voles and birds um, and is one of the main reasons why water voles are declining um, still and uh, one of the reasons why the water vole may well be lost. It's quite distinctive. It's generally a dark animal uh, with a white chin, but it is quite variable. You can get uh, paler ones, you can get much darker ones, black ones. Um, they have a very short, somewhat bushy tail, um, but they're usually found in or near water. Uh, they like to hunt along riverbanks and lakesides, places like that. They will eat whole range of different things. Small mammals, rabbits, birds, frogs, gnats, uh, like many of the mustelids do. Um, and they will, yeah, they're pretty much everywhere. Um, any river, stream or pond, you might well find them. We've certainly got them where we are. Uh, and there's a very good chance that most rivers and streams have got them as well. That's the known distribution. Um, again, it's an underrepresentation of where they're likely to be. Um, so uh, keep your eyes open and um, you know, if you find a breeding female, you'll, um, you'll certainly find uh, lots of sightings there. Uh, the breeding females are a main problem for some of our native animals because she's denned up in a little tunnel somewhere, raising her kits and killing everything uh, within that stretch of water. Um, so it's a big problem for any resident water voles that might happen to be there. Now we move on to the fox. These are only uh, representative of the dog family uh, that's wild and native to the UK and to Wales. I'm sure we're all familiar with the fox. It's a rabbit specialist, though it will eat lots of other things. Distinctive orangey red fur and a bushy tail. They've got black tips to their ears, black legs. Um, a very obvious animal that most people have seen. They're common pretty much everywhere except on the high tops again and on shooting estates where they tend to be shot. Um, they hunt rabbits, voles, birds, they raid nests, they eat fruit, they eat anything that they can get hold of. Uh, a good tip is if you find a, um, a den somewhere uh, with bits of dead animal lying around it, it's probably a, a fox den with cubs. Uh, so definitely worth setting up a trail camera uh, to see if you can get some good footage. And that's the known distribution of fox. Um, but again, as I said, they're, they're pretty much all over the place. Now we'll move on to the deer. Um, we've only got three species maybe four in North Wales. The roe deer is our smallest native deer, um, a beautiful animal, under-recorded um, maybe or largely absent. We don't really know. I think probably they're slowly moving in from England, um, but they could turn up almost anywhere. Um, obviously near woodland or in woodland, they've got a distinctive barking alarm call, uh, which is very distinctive. Um, so um, you can find that online and if you hear that then you can be pretty certain it's a, a roe deer. They've got very short antlers, uh, obviously just bucks. No obvious tail. Their, their bum is white or, or sort of um, off-white, uh, so no tail. 
So if you see a deer without a tail, then that's probably a row. They have a very cute black nose, um, as you saw in the previous uh, photograph, uh, white lips. They browse on trees and shrubs, so they're not very popular with foresters. Um, and a good survey tip is if you find small trees uh, with uh, circular paths around them, um, sometimes you have a couple of trees side by side and it'd be a figure of eight path between the two trees. Um, that would be the, the roe deer in their rutting season between July and August, um, going round and round in circles around the trees and sometimes thrashing them with their antlers as well. This is the known distribution of roe deer. Um, it, according to this, there aren't many. Um, there is certainly one in Denby. I've had a recent record in Denby, uh, up near the castle. So they are about, uh, and probably moving in from the east. Uh, but they're, they're a lovely little deer and certainly well worth recording if you find one. The fallow deer is an introduced species. Um, very localised populations, but those populations can be quite dense. It's quite possible to see tens or even twenties of these animals together. Um, they're quite a big deer, uh, not as big as a red, but uh, much bigger than the roe deer, mainly found in or near woodland. And you'll notice the, the tail there is very distinctive, black top to the tail against a white bum. So if you see a black tail against a white bum, then that's probably a fallow deer and those distinctive palmate antlers uh, during the rutting season. The fawns are spotted. Sometimes people stumble across the fawns. Um, they're not the only deer with spotted fawns, but uh, they, these are probably the most common in North Wales. Uh, they usually town or fawn the, the adults, but they can be paler, they can be white, or they can be almost black. The localised populations uh, are especially around the Kevin Estate, Abergelly area, around the Abergelly Hospital. Uh, there are also a group near Anglesey or on Anglesey near Llangevny, um, which we stumbled across. Um, they may also be elsewhere. So again, if you see um, if you see fallow deer, please report them on to Covnod. And the survey tip is the white bun with the black stripe. So that's easy to remember. That's the known distribution. Um, it doesn't show the Anglesey group, um, which is quite interesting, um, but it does show one or two others elsewhere over towards uh, Wrexham and Chester area. Um, so again, worth recording. And then we have the muntjac. This is uh, a tiny deer. It's introduced, it's spread through the UK quite rapidly uh, for small animal, but it's usually not noticed. Um, but it does eat, eat rose bushes, so if it turns up in people's gardens, they do tend to notice it then, and it's not very popular. It has, it's got a very hunched appearance. It's got a hunch back, if you like. The, the back end is higher than the, the neck, um, and it's quite squat. Usually only found solitary or, or in pairs. Um, is it under-recorded or is it absent? I think it's largely under-recorded in the east, uh, probably absent in the west, um, but I suspect they might be in Gwydda Forest, uh, going by anecdotal records from quite a long time ago. So currently trying to find that out. Um, the bucks have got generally, have got short antlers. Um, the, the females don't have antlers at all. Um, these animals also bark, but not quite the same as, uh, as a roe deer. So if you find very small deer droppings, deer droppings are fairly distinctive usually, um, and deer prints at about basically two and a half centimetres an inch, um, then you may well find, uh, find muntjac there. Um, so uh, well worth recording because we really don't know where they are. Um, this is the distribution map and there's virtually nothing there. So keep your eyes open for those. Red deer. Are they here or are they not? 
I don't think they're here unless there are some that have spread up from South Wales, where I think there might be uh, a small population. Um, it's our largest native deer, very large with a pale bum, um, large pointy antlers, uh, older males have more points, and the stags roar, they don't bark, they roar in the rut in late September. So if they're, if they're rutting, you know they're about, and they have big droppings in big piles. So uh, that's pretty distinctive. If you find big heaps of droppings that are obviously deer with the dimple in one end and a point on the other, uh, then that's probably red deer. I'd be surprised if you find them in North Wales, but you never know. This is the uh, known distribution. Um, and there's just this one record of, I think, two deer uh, down in the south. Uh, of North Wales, um, down near um, Dinsmouth, mouth the area, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, it's worth, worth keeping an eye out for them, but um, there probably aren't many about. Then we'll move on to the squirrels. Um, the red squirrel, obviously, is our only native squirrel. Um, they've been largely replaced throughout the whole of the UK by grey squirrels. Uh, they find would be normally found in a wide variety of woodlands if the greys weren't there. Uh, they are legally protected now under Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. They eat a really wide variety of foods, including birds, insects, birds, eggs, nut, fungi, nuts and fruit. And there's a myth that they prefer conifer woodlands. Uh, they don't prefer conifer woodlands. Uh, they retreat to conifer woodlands in the face of grey squirrels. Um, they will quite happily live in broadleaf woodlands, in oak woodlands, in pretty much any type of woodland as long as there's sufficient food and with a wide variety of food sources then um, you know they're quite happy. Certain times of year they can look grey which can cause confusion. Uh, unfortunately at certain times of year greys look red um, which adds even more confusion. So uh, but one of the distinctive features of the grey squirrel, uh, sorry, <sighs> get this right, I'm on the red squirrel, can look grey at certain times, the greys can look red. Um, the distinctive features of the red squirrel are the ear tufts, which are seasonal though. So um, only certain times of year you'll get the ear tufts. They cannot coexist with grey squirrels, uh, no matter what you read. Um, there is no way that red squirrels can coexist with greys because greys outcompete them and they give them squirrel pox. Survey tip for any squirrel is to listen for the scratching of their claws on tree bark as you're going through woodlands. Um, that's a very easy way to see if there are squirrels about. It's illegal to kill, injure, take, damage or destroy its shelter or disturb it in its shelter unless apparently um, you are doing forestry operations. Um, there is a loophole in the law uh, which doesn't allow protection of red squirrels. Um, for forestry operations, which is rather unfortunate. This is the uh, distribution of red squirrels at the moment, mostly on Anglesey. Um, they are also spreading and have spread onto the mainland around Bangor, Bethesda, even as far as Lamberis. Um, they do turn up in Bangor town sometimes, and then the other population is Clochinog, which uh, is more at risk from grey squirrel incursion. The grey squirrel is an in invasive non-native, uh, completely replaced the red squirrel in most areas, common and widespread. The distinguishing feature uh, of these, whichever colour fur they have, is on the tail you can see on the, on the photograph there, there's a, a pale edge to the, to the right hand side of the tail there, there's also one left. So if you see a squirrel with a pale edge on both sides of the tail, then it's almost certainly a grey. They prefer deciduous woodland, but they will do well in some types of conifer forest, including pine, uh, which is why they do rather well in the lodgepole pine on, uh, in Newbra Forest on Anglesey. Again, they eat the same things as the red squirrels, but they live much higher densities than reds. Um, so sometimes 10 times as many grey squirrels as you would get reds in the same area. 
and you're never far from one um, unless you're on Anglesey where they've pretty much been eradicated um, and allowing the reds to uh, recover. This is the distribution of greys that, as I said, everywhere except Anglesey, uh, although the odd one does turn up. If you see one on Anglesey, please report it. Um, anywhere else, they're everywhere. Um, all through the Gwydir Forest uh, and other areas such as that, um, although the records aren't, aren't largely there, they're not reported because they're common, as Sam was saying. And the bonus animal um, is the beaver. We don't have any um, legally released animals living wild and free in Wales at the moment. Um, there is a reintrodu reintroduced population or at least a couple of reintroduced animals um, on the Wildlife Trust Reserve uh, further south. Uh, they create wetlands basically, that's what they do. They create wetlands and biodiverse habitats such as the one in the, in the photograph there which is in Poland. Uh, they fell trees to provide themselves with food and they're found on rivers and lakes. And they're an ecosystem engineer, uh, rarely seen but the tree stumps that they cut or that they leave when they've cut the trees uh, are distinctive. If you do see one in the water it will be almost fully submerged um, and if it's, if it's disturbed or alarmed it will slap its tail on the water and disappear underwater. But the survey tip is to look for pointed stumps such as these, uh, very distinctive. They have no legal protection in Wales as far as I'm aware, um, although they're European protected species, but as there are no uh, official legally authorised uh, populations in Wales yet, um, they're not yet on the legally protected list. This is the current distribution, which is basically the dovey. Uh, there are apparently uh, one or two, maybe more, down on the dovey. Um, they may turn up elsewhere, either through illegal releases or migration, um, but they're pretty thin on the ground. Um, a couple of extra bits of information. The pine martin, um, if you see one or think you've seen one, you need a detailed description or a photograph, ideally, um, to, to help the mammal recorders work out whether it could be one or not. Because they can turn up anywhere, then it's very difficult for a, for a recorder or a verifier such as myself to, to know whether it's a genuine record or not. So if you put a detailed description in, or if you're lucky, a photograph, um, then that will help us a great deal. Roe deer, again, um, the same situation. We don't have many records. We don't know what the distribution is. So a detailed description, if you enter one, uh, would be very welcome. Fallow deer, if it's outside of those known areas that I mentioned, um, again, a detailed description would be useful. Red deer, if they're here, um, again, a detailed description, otherwise they will be classed as an incorrect uh, record. Red squirrels, if you find any that are outside Anglesey or Plakainog, please report them. Um, we know of the ones around Bangor and Bethesda. Uh, they may spread further, so definitely worth keeping an eye out for those. Grey squirrels, any reported, any seen on Anglesey should be reported uh, to protect the red squirrels. Um, and any reported on Anglesey will need a, a detailed description, um, otherwise uh, they may be discounted. And beavers, we don't know if there have been any other author unauthorised releases um, other than the dovey. Uh, so if you think you found beavers uh, then and you're putting it into Covnod, then please give us a detailed description um, and uh, we'll consider it. Uh, but um, officially they, they're not there except on the dovey. And that's it for me. <laughs>